open to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you don't have a copy of the scripture with you this evening, uh, I would encourage you to find one under one of the chairs, or if you see somebody that doesn't have a copy of the scripture, open it 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and hand it to them. Because we do want you to know tonight that what we preach is not because it's our opinion, but what we preach is what we found in the scripture. I don't want to leave anybody uh, with the impression that pastor believes this and you should do what pastor says. I want to leave people with the impression that this is what the Word of God says and you should be concerned with what God says. And so I want to just kind of, uh, again, preach sort of a, a timely topical message this evening and I want to <coughs> deal with something that uh, keeps coming up a lot lately and just would like to present it from a biblical perspective or maybe give you the perspective that's kind of settled me because of what the Scripture says about it. And so... I will we'll read our text, and I'll tell you what the topic is, and we'll pray and ask the Lord to help us with our understanding tonight. You ready? Chapter 10, look down, if you will, please, with me to verse 14. And uh, I want to simply read verse 14, and we'll talk about our topic, and then we'll pray. Okay, you ready? Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Our topic this evening is uh, celebrating Christmas. Celebrating Christmas. And we'll pray. Father, I thank you tonight for the Scripture, for the clarity that is in it. And I pray that this evening as we look at many, many principles, which are not vague, but are actually very clear, that you would help us to have the wisdom and the maturity, Lord, to glean from these principles truth that would help us to be confident in how we live, how we walk, and confident in encouraging others to do the same also, we ask in Jesus' precious name, amen. How many of you are hearing or have heard, especially in the last several years, uh, that Christmas is a pagan holiday? Have they heard that? Oh, you know, we don't want to celebrate pagan Christmas. Uh, I've, I've caught it from a lot of people about for celebrating the birthday of Jesus, that this is a pagan thing, and of course Easter is much the same the time of the year when we celebrate the resurrection. And I hear it quite a lot. And the fact of the matter is, is that oftentimes the spirit that's in me, which believe I believe helps us to discern a lot of truth, the spirit in me uh, is unsettled or un, uh, not, not okay, very, very troubled, very bothered. Now, I'll just be quite honest with you. My wife will tell you this about me. And about days. You know when the scripture says in Romans 14 that one man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike, that every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. My wife will tell you that I am of the personality to esteem every day alike. In other words, my birthday is not even a special day for me. Uh, I just, you know, some of y'all, it's like, man, it's my birthday today. You expect, you know, to be acknowledged, and I'll do my best to acknowledge you and recognize that that's important to you. And, uh, you know, it's a big day for you, big celebration, that sort of thing. It just isn't for me. I just, I'm just one of those guys that life is so good that it's just, there's not a lot of variety in it. It's all good. You know? <laughs> I'm mean, being really serious about it. That's kind of my personality. It's like, yeah, it's a great day. So is yesterday. So will tomorrow be. No. You know, they, it's just life's good. You know, I like that even keel, steady as she goes, happy every day, happy all the time. And I don't like to have to wait anyway to get things I want. So this idea of, you know, get me, you know, wait for my birthday or wait till Christmas or wait till there's a gift giving time to get the thing. No, when I want something, I want to go and buy it and then have it. And that makes me just as happy as it makes you to wait for it, I think. So <laughs> I'm one of these, you know, every day's alike kind of people. But I will say this, not every day is alike, and I'm only that way to a particular extent. Um, my dad ruined Christmas for me growing up because he was the very definition of the Grinch, but he never got his heart changed, you know, like the Grinch did. You know, his heart was like 10 sizes too small. Well, my dad, you know, every year my dad's New Year's resolution was, this year we're cutting back. Now, how do you cut back from zero? You know, it was kind of like, you know, let's go eat, let's go eat Christmas dinner. I'm not kidding you. Let's go eat Christmas dinner with the homeless. You know, and that's what we wanted. Not, not let's go feed the homeless. Let's go eat dinner with the homeless. Let's act like we're homeless for Christmas time. Yeah, you say, Pastor, are you serious? Yeah, I'm not kidding at all. I had a couple of those years, and I hated that uh, as Christmas. You know, why can't we just go eat Christmas with our family? 
You know, they were, they were having Christmas. Why couldn't we? It's, my wife's laughing because it's really my dad. This is the way he is. You know, and so every year it's just like, we're cutting back. There's not going to be any Christmas this year for sure. You know, and mm -hmm. so it was one of those things that just kind of took, kind of sucked the life out of it for you as a kid. You know, you're like, well, you know, <laughs> there's no Christmas anyway. What difference does it make? And my wife's the complete opposite. I went fishing Friday. Haven't gotten to go fishing since January, but I went fishing Friday. And I knew it's because it was the day after Thanksgiving. I knew that when I came home Friday that the Thanksgiving things would be put away and the Christmas things would be out. And I actually was kind of surprised when I got home late Friday night to find that she had only subtly decorated the house. I mean, it wasn't like, boom, Christmas time. It was just kind of like, you know, wreaths and, you know, little uh, lights and, and uh, you know, wintry looking things that said Merry Christmas and that sort. I thought that was kind of a minor dose of Christmas, you know, in our home. Uh, but... All that being said, I'm sick and tired of hearing people say we shouldn't celebrate Jesus' birthday. How about you? Yes. That's got, I'm, I'm just ticked off about it, to be quite honest with you. I understand people that hate Jesus. Why do we have to celebrate a Christmas, a Christian holiday? Why do we all have to, you know, why do you have to force your Christianity? I understand people that hate Jesus, not want to celebrate uh, Christmas. I'm sick of hearing it from people that are supposed to love Jesus. Uh, I, and I'm just telling you, this is my sentiment. I'm not telling you from the Scripture. We're going to look at what the Scripture says here a minute ago. But I'm tired of it. I don't want to hear people who uh, realize that the greatest event that ever happened in this world was when Jesus came to die on the cross for sinners. And that's why Jesus came. Literally, from the moment man first sinned, God made a promise to the woman. He said, of thy seed said, thy seed is going to bruise the serpent's head. And that's the seed of a woman. That's physically, that's impossible biologically speaking. We know that, don't we? And it was a prophecy of the virgin birth. And from that first generation, the Scripture traces individuals who believed the promise and individuals who did not believe the promise. But people that believed the promise, I mean literally it was their entire life. What do you think about a guy like Abraham leaving his father's house and going to a land that God would tell him, and his entire life never getting there. And yet he believed by faith, and his faith was counted for righteousness, and his whole life was worthwhile. What do you think about uh, Isaac and Ishmael and the conflict between the two of them? Because Isaac and Ishmael really was bitter over the fact that Isaac was the son of promise. And what a big deal it was to be a son of promise. The fact that Isaac married uh, from the right family and, and Ishmael tried to imitate that but never, uh, never got past the profane aspect of that. What do you think about Esau profaning the, his birthright and Jacob wanting it like everything, enough to steal it, their dirty trickster, but he wanted the spiritual promise. It mattered to him. What do you think about uh, the sons of David? Wanting the throne, not just for the power, but wanting to be that heir of promise and the significance of Solomon. Of all the boys who should have been chosen, being chosen because he was this promised seed. What do you think about the people like we looked at that are in the line of, of Jesus that really shouldn't have been, but, they, but that coveted and wanted to be? Individuals like Tamar. Individuals like Rahab. Individuals like Ruth. Uh, individuals like Bathsheba. What do you think about that? Well, it mattered to them as a significant thing that the Christ child would be born. My friend, every person who has been born is dealing with the same problem, and that's the problem that our sin has separated from us from our God. And that we have consciences that are overcome by our guilt and by our conviction. And there's only one thing that takes care of that, and that's the sacrifice of of the sinless Son of God. And it was a big deal when Jesus came. Every sacrifice that was ever offered before Jesus came, my friend, was a picture of the ultimate sacrifice. I want to tell you, you get tired of pictures after a while. You want the real thing. And after about 4,000 years, Christ came. He was born. And that's a significant event. And I'm a little bit frustrated that Christians think we oughtn't to celebrate it. I don't want to use terms to describe that because they wouldn't be nice. But friend, it doesn't make any sense at all, actually. 
Now I want to look at the arguments or the accusations that are made, and I'm not going to look at them technically. I have in the past, we have before. I recommend for everybody, I think a good read, a book you ought to have in your library, should be uh, The Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ by Harold Honer. Very, very technical dealing with the actual birth date of Jesus. I believe Jesus is born on December 25th, and I think you can definitively pretty much prove that. Uh, you can absolutely prove the day that Jesus died on the cross, the date of, of Easter. And I'm just telling you, it's not a secret, it's not a mystery, it's not hard to figure out, actually. And that's a technical book that when you read it, if you carefully read it and study it and you look at the arguments for and against and so forth, you'll come to the conclusion, yeah, this isn't a mystery. This is something we can know. And I think that that's a help, but I'm not going to talk about that this evening. I'm not going to get technical this evening. Uh, first of all, because I'm not in the frame of mind for it. Uh, <laughs> but secondly, you all fall asleep on it. I just want to state it to you. If you want to look at it, the facts are there. And if you want facts, you can have them. They're free, they're for you, and we want you to have them, as Pastor McClure, my pastor, used to always say. Well, here we go. I do want to look at some biblical principles about things that are, quote, pagan signs or symbols. Anybody notice the moon today? We were in Miami Beach, Nicholas pointed out, it's half moon. I mean, just clear as day at, what, 4, four o'clock in the afternoon? I mean, just a bright, vivid moon today. And do you know that some people worship the moon? Yeah. Uh, the, the sun, it was, it was out today as well. Do you know some people worship the sun? Let me give you a news flash here for just a second. There are people who worship the earth. I know you're shocked right now, but actually, uh, that's, those, those three gods would be the pagan gods that were the origination of the gods of Allah. There was the Allah, Allah moon, Allah sun, Allah earth. Those three gods were the pagan gods of Allah. And uh, when Mohammed, with his Catholic and uh, Judaic influence, when he developed his religion of, of Islam, his background was to take his gods of Allah and, and uh, take the god of Israel and the god of the Catholics, both of whom at the time would have been kind of a skewed version, not the god of the Scripture exactly. But when he formulated his religion, he named God after the gods of Allah. Early in the Quran, uh, uh, Muhammad said that there are three gods of Allah. Later on, when his family, or wait, later on, he said there's only one god, Allah. And then his family were going to kill him because he said that, and so he said there's three gods. Then later on, he got to be powerful enough, he wasn't afraid of his pagan family. And then he said there's only one god, Allah. Well, yeah, I mean, people worship the sun, the moon, and the earth, don't they? Uh, a lot of people have a problem with the lunar calendar. How many of you have heard? I don't like to. I don't like the calendar because Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and all the you know the the days of the calendar you know are uh, named after the planets. Let me just clue you in on something real quickly. God created an orderly universe with systems and cycles. And did you know that the moon once a month makes a full rotation, full cycle? And God made it that way. God made the moon. Now, someone may be foolish enough to worship something that God has made, but God still made it. Who's it belong to? Who made the sun? God did. Okay, I just want to get as practical as I can about these things. Now, there may be people that worship the sun, and there are actually. But God made it. Uh, who made the earth? There are a lot of earth worshipers, aren't there? There are organizations for worshiping the earth. What do you think Greenpeace is? if not an earth-worshipping organization. I'm not trying to pick on any particular groups this evening. I'm just pointing out some, you know, just simple, easy-to-understand facts. There are earth-worshippers, aren't there? Uh, we're not actually joking when we talk about tree-huggers. I have a lot of friends that used to be tree-huggers. I mean, literally, they worship trees, worship plants. Not only do they think you shouldn't eat animals, they think you shouldn't eat plants. You know, I'm not sure what they should eat. I notice they're all still living, so they must be eating something. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what it is. But, uh, you know, they're against anything that they worship, and they worship anything and everything. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you do. Okay, so here's the question. As a believer, how do I sort out what I believe? Because isn't it true that pagans do these things? And uh, regarding Christmas celebration, the evergreen tree, by the way. Now, I grew up in a humbug family. We didn't have a Christmas tree in our home ever when I was growing up. So this was not, not an issue for me. Matter of fact, uh, 
We don't have much of a Christmas tree in our home, even though my wife grew up in a pagan family that had <laughs> Christmas trees. And so <laughs> we, we have one this tall in our bathroom right now, and it's used for a nightlight. Uh, uh, but let me just say this. I'm not against Christmas trees. Now, I've had people ask me, they call me on the phone, think about visiting your church. So I just want to ask you a really important question. I'm thinking, what are they going to ask me? A really important question. I, you know, good. And they say, do you, have a, do, you, do you have a Christmas tree at Christmas? And I think, you know, what in the world does that have to do with anything that has to do with visiting our church? <laughs> you have a Christmas tree at Christmas. And what they want to say is, if you have a Christmas tree at Christmas, you have pagan uh, symbol, or, uh, symbols in your worship. You're worshiping like a pagan, and we don't want to come to your church because you're a pagan. I'm not a pagan, okay? I've never been a pagan. I've never worshipped the moon. I've never even hummed at the sun. And I sure have never worshipped the earth. I'm not a pagan. And I'll be quite honest with you, if I want to cut down a Christmas tree and put it inside and decorate it and, and uh, make it smell good, I'll do it. I'm just kind of a humbug. That's why I don't really do that as often as my wife would wish that I would. But the question is, is that pastor's opinion? Is that just, well, you know what, you just have an opinion? Or is, or is there something in the Bible that helps us to discern these things? And the answer is in the affirmative. And I want to look at it tonight in the Scripture. Now, Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, and he's talking to them about a lot of things that are problems. And one of the problems that's crept into the church at Corinth is that the pagans have got some practices, or they have come out of some practices, that are just flat-out idolatry. I mean, they're just worshiping idols. And we know that idols aren't legitimate because there isn't anything on earth that is the same as God. God is the only God. When God said, Thou shalt uh, have no other gods before me, it wasn't a matter of primacy. We said this a few weeks ago. It wasn't God saying, I want to be number one. No, He's God. There is no other God. And you put some other idol or some other God in God's place, my friend, you've just given place to something that doesn't even exist in reality as a God. You're worshiping something created instead of the Creator, and that's nonsense, and God's not okay with it, as well he should not be. I think we understand that. We can prove that easily from the Scripture from uh, dozens of texts. But Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, and in verse 24, he's talking about temptation, and one of the things that he says is, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, free, flee, not free, flee from idolatry. And he uses an illustration of the cup. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Now here he is not talking about Jesus' body being bread, or bread being Jesus' literal body, or, or the cup being Jesus' literal blood. He's talking about us all being one as Israel and as the church. That's the illustration then. But he goes on to say in verse 18, Behold Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then? That the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the thing which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. So Paul points out he said, I'm not concerned about people eating meat that's sacrificed to something. I'm not saying there's any legitimacy to the idols that the meat has been sacrificed to. He said, but there are devils that they do represent. And that is an issue. That is a problem. In other words, for a person who says, this is the devil that this is uh, sacrificed to that I'm partaking of, well, that person is certainly acknowledging the devil in doing that, isn't he? He's certainly acknowledging the Satan. And Paul goes on to say in verse 21, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. So you can't do both. You say, Pastor, who'd want to do both? Some people. <laughs> Some people. Uh, one of the things that I've realized in witnessing or sharing the gospel of Hindus is that they're very willing to add Jesus to their menagerie of gods. They're willing to say, okay, I'll trust Jesus as my Savior and this God and this God and this God and all this God. 
this elephant faced God and this elephant faced God and this rhinoceros faced God and this all the weird things that they make up for gods. Well, my friend, we don't partake. And, I, and you know, I'm not, I don't want to make you laugh because it really isn't funny. But you can't worship Jesus and you then worship idols. You can't really do both. And what Paul is saying is not that it's impossible to try. What he's saying is you're not worshiping God if you're worshiping idols. You're not doing both. You get that? If you're acknowledging an idol, you are not acknowledging God as a supreme God, are you? And that's the only God He is, the only God He's willing to be. He's not willing to share what only He is with something or someone who isn't what He is. That makes sense, right? Okay, so what does that have to do with Christmas? Well, we get to, we get to some points that do have to do with it. In verse 23, Paul said, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Now this is where the Christmas tree debate gets tough for me. Am I allowed to have a Christmas tree? Let me ask you a question. I don't want to ask this question. Better answer it right, okay? <laughs> Do you think that if I put a tree in my house, I would be acknowledging pagans who worship the evergreen. No. Do you think I'd do that? You think I'd worship? I don't even know what the pagans do. I mean, I'm just being honest. I don't know what it means to them, and it certainly wouldn't mean that to me. You get it? Okay. So, the Bible says all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. Expedient means better than it could be. And then it goes on to say all things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever met someone who worships evergreen trees? Knowledgeably. Like, do you know an evergreen tree worshiper? Anybody here personally acquainted? You could give the name. This is my friend who worships evergreens. The way they say that pagans do and the way they say that you're doing at Christmas time. You know who does? I, I met some... I used to work for a man who claimed to do things like that. Yeah. He claimed to like worship trees or evergreens in particular? What's that? You want his name? Yeah, what's his name? Thomas Chappelle. Thomas Chappelle. Okay. You better watch it. Uh, putting up a Christmas tree. Oh, he's gone. Okay, so that's not valid. All right. You know, here's the deal. Practically speaking, if this thing were not to edify or if this thing were to harm somebody, it would be a guy like Thomas Chappelle that would be affected by it. You get what I'm saying? In other words, if I'm trying to edify somebody, when somebody says, oh, you're worshiping an evergreen tree, and I don't even know what worshiping an evergreen tree is, and the person saying that to me has never worshipped an evergreen tree and is not tempted to worship an evergreen tree, then it probably isn't something that's going to be a problem. Does that make sense? In other words, I'm not going to stray from believing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no other way to God, to the Father but by Him, because I found an evergreen tree. God made evergreen trees. He made them. Now, if there were somebody in this congregation who was saved from evergreen worship, it sounds funny, but I'm serious about it. They were saved out of evergreen worship. I'd think twice before we put an evergreen tree in here, wouldn't you? See, that'd be an issue for that person, wouldn't it? And that's the point. Paul, Paul proves that point, or elaborates on that point in the next verse when he says, Let no man seek his own, but the, every other man's, or every man another's wealth. He goes on to say in verse 25, Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. So you're shopping in the shambles and people got hunks of meat laid out on the ground. You go up and say, Which particular idol was this one sacrificed to? You better not ask that question. Because the god or the goddess that that thing is sacrificed to will be acknowledged in your mind when you eat it. So Paul said, when you whatever sold in the shambles, he says, don't ask. You know, it's don't ask, don't tell before that existed, right? Uh, don't ask what it came from because you don't want your conscience to be aware of something that it has to deal with. My friend, this is, an, this is the principle of having an innocent conscience. Paul illustrates the same thing to the church at Rome when he says, I would have you be wise concerning that which is good and simple concerning the evil. I'll be honest with you, I'm not going to go and find books to read about the solstice and about the evergreen. 
I don't care about that, for one thing. And two, I don't, I don't want to sharpen my awareness of something that is incorrect because anybody who thinks the evergreen is the source or the, the, the uh, way to life, if that's what they believe, I don't even want to consider some kind of nonsense like that because Jesus is the only means for life. You know what I'm saying? I don't need to know. God made evergreen trees and they're nice and they smell good. I like them. Outside the house. That is. <laughs> okay. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Did you see that? Okay. Whose is the evergreen tree? Huh? God's. God's. Okay, let me just give you a fact. I'm going I'm to give you the fact. It's up to you to search it out. There are people who worship evergreen trees. That's a fact. You know, it won't be hard to search that out. And there are people who say because people worship evergreen trees, it's not valid for believers to have trees and decorate them in the wintertime when it's cold outside and have something that's still alive and to brighten up their home with them for Christmas or whatever it means to you when you put a Christmas tree in your house. However, that being said, God made evergreen trees. And even if somebody worships an evergreen tree, it doesn't take away from God. You know how many things believers wouldn't have if the wicked could take it from us? How much we wouldn't have? We've already lost a lot of vocabulary, haven't we? The, the rainbow's been reinvented, hasn't it? It's a sign of God's promise that He won't destroy the earth again by flood. That's what it is. That's what God made. We've got words in our vocabulary that we're not supposed to use because they mean something different. And you know something? We don't need to be giving up anything else. God made words. God made concepts. God made things good. Uh, you know, in the church, particular churches like ours have lost a lot in the area of the influence of God's Holy Spirit. Because of false teaching about God's Spirit, the nonsense that happens for theatrics and for show and to, to uh, manipulate people. The nonsense individuals like Benny Hinn and uh, whoever the modern day uh, nonsense that they, that they carry on. God doesn't do that. But many believers, because of what charismatics are wrong about, have just given up something, an entire important doctrine that is vital to our faith, simply because of an abuse of the same. I'll tell you something. God owns trees. <laughs> the most significant event that ever happened on Christmas Day is Jesus' birth. Some pagan may have something that they think is significant, but I'm telling you the most significant thing that ever happened in the world was that Jesus Christ was born. Isn't that so? Okay, so are we going to give up the most significant day, the most significant time, because somebody else worships something else on that day? No, I'm sorry, but God has primacy in my life. And uh, I worship Jesus on Christmas Day. And a pagan may worship something else, but it still belongs to God. Every day is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's. The Bible says, and the fullness thereof. Everything in this world belongs to God. And we as believers need to not give things away. Not let things be stolen from us, taken, taken from us. Christians want to get sometimes into these whole conspiracy theories about, oh, you're being manipulated to believe this or do this. And, and, and you know what? There's a lot of people, there are a lot of people who at different times have done evil things. That has nothing to do with what it means to me. I'm not worshiping something pagan on Christmas Day. I'm celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. Okay, so all that being said, let's, let's get practical about some things then. If we're not willing to give up the day, let's don't give it up. And let's be honest about not giving it up. Let's don't let it become something other than what it is. I'm against the commercialization of Christmas. I don't like it. I like Christmas music being played in the stores at Christmas time, but I don't like it being a buy stuff and give 
so that we can get rich. It's not what Christmas is about. And I think it's fine to give gifts, and I understand that the Magi gave gifts because Jesus Christ came, albeit perhaps not the moment He was born. But the reality of it is, is that it's a fine thing to give gifts. I think for Christmas, I think that maybe, as believers, maybe we should give gifts to Jesus on Christmas Day instead of gifts to each other. Makes sense. Yeah, that's good, isn't it? Uh, well, what can I give him? Give him your heart. That's what the song says. <laughs> what can I give him? Poor as I am, if I were a shepherd, I'd bring a lamb for a wise man. I'd do my part. Well, yet yeah, what I can give him, I can give him my heart. You know what you could, you could give? I mean, the, what you would spend commercially, couldn't you give to a ministry that would reach people with the gospel? Couldn't you, couldn't you do the very same thing? In other words, gift giving, shouldn't it be? Don't you love it when somebody gives something in your name? <laughs> <laughs> I supported a missionary in your name for Christmas. Thank you. It's sort of like somebody naming a star after you and you know giving you the certificate. Thanks. <laughs> Seriously. I, I'm against the commercialization of Christmas, and I think it'd be great to give, give it to Jesus. You know, last year, that was what I endeavored to do for Christmas Day. Uh, Christmas fell on Sunday, and I already think we should worship Jesus on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. And so I just, just went all, my wife and I, we just kind of went all out for Christmas. Like just worshiping all day. We, we started here for Sunday school and then Sunday morning church and then we went down to Miami Beach and celebrated there in the afternoon. We came here and it was just a wonderful Christmas. One of the most memorable Christmases in my life. And one of the reasons is because we very, very deliberately worshiped Jesus. We didn't cancel church on Christmas Day. That's right. We didn't cancel church on Christmas Day because we figured that uh, it would be more appropriate uh, to worship Jesus on His birthday uh, than any other time. So why worship our family or do our family schedule an event on Christmas Day? And so we did that. Okay, enough of that. That's a suggestion. Now let's finish up. Um, in verse 27, the Bible says, If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and you be disposed to go... Whatsoever set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. This, again, I, I, man, I don't want to be controversial. I don't want to offend anybody this evening. Some years ago, I went to a Christmas concert in a nearby local town. And while there, with some people that were singing, you know, in the concert and so forth, they introduced us to some friends of theirs. And I said to the friends, because it was a Christmas concert, I said, Merry Christmas. And they said, Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> and I didn't say Happy Hanukkah back. I wasn't being snotty. I wasn't being rude. But I think that they were. We were at a Christmas celebration, and they said, Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> you know, celebrate Hanukkah if you want to. It's all right. I've got some reasons not to. That's not the point this evening either. But I don't acknowledge Hanukkah because I'm a Christian. And Jews who are believers shouldn't acknowledge Hanukkah. And there are reasons for that. I'm not making that up. I'm not just being mean or snotty about it. I'm just telling you. In other words... I'm not going to acknowledge something God doesn't. That's what the Scripture here commands me to do. Whereas there's nothing... If somebody says, Happy Solstice, in response, I'm not going to say, Happy Solstice. I believe in solstices. <laughs> you know, you see what I'm saying? I believe in solstices, but there's no worship in it for me. And I, they, they don't even make me happy. The eclipse did nothing for me. I ate at Sonny's. Devin and I did. And we had barbecue ribs and we were tickled to death because there was nobody in the entire restaurant because they were all out looking at a stupid eclipse. And we got racks of ribs just packed. They, they, they had all these ribs. At, at Sunday's, nobody was there to eat them. And so they just gave them all to Devin and I. You know? It was a great thing, the eclipse. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't enjoy the eclipse. But this is, I'm just telling you, you know, there's an eclipse. I'm not going to worship the eclipse. There are, it, it bothered me a little bit how excited people got over the eclipse. I'm just like, you know, it, it's an eclipse. It happens. God made it. Like everything else. You know, go burn your eyes on it if you want to, but I'm not going to. 
this is not that big a deal. You know? Okay. I'm not, and again, I'm not picking at anybody. I understand for some of you, uh, some of you stargazers, it's, it's really neat. You know, it, it's an opportunity I don't appreciate like you do. In verse 28, if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto, unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, again, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Do you notice that's stated two times in the Scripture here in this passage? For emphasis, it's important. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. In other words, don't eat it for his conscience. It doesn't mean anything in the world to you. But if he says, this is unto the idol, whatever, and you say, uh, I'm, not, I'm not eating unto the idol. A lot of times Christians, we just kind of go along and we try to be polite with paganism, and I'm not going to do that. Because the earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. I'm not going to worship something and offend my God. You see, oftentimes we're more concerned about offending people who are offending God than we do offending God. I'm more concerned, and I ought to be more concerned, I ought to be more careful to be concerned with offending my God. And Paul goes on to say, For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, what does it say? Do all the glory of God. Now, Christian, I want to just give you uh, a simple answer to should you have a Christmas tree. Do it to the glory of God if you're going to. Don't do it to the glory of whatever the evergreen God is. Do it to the glory of God. And if you do it to the glory of God, my friend, that's what it is. Especially if you haven't educated yourself and tried to figure out how do I accurately worship a Christmas tree? See, if you do it that way, it's not to the glory of God, is it? But if you say, well, this is part of my Christmas celebration, and way before pagans started worshiping trees, believers actually, uh, and this is traceable fact, it's historical that believers, uh, you know, always liked the evergreen tree, green tree because it was a sign of constant life. So it was a picture of, uh, of life, and so whatever you want to have one, do it to the glory of God. That's actually what the text there says this evening. That's my official position on it. I don't know whether we ought to have a tree in here this evening. I haven't figured out whether Joel has any other friends that might be offended by it. But the Bible does say in verse 32, Give none offense neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God. Don't offend anybody. Even as I please... Oh, by, by the way, it doesn't say don't offend people so go along with them. Right? How do you offend them according to context? You offend them by partaking in something that contradicts worship of God. That's the context. So give none offense, neither Jews nor the Gentiles, nor the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. So pastor, what do you say when somebody calls and asks if you have a Christmas tree in your home? Do you laugh at them? Do you hang up the phone? Do you infuriate them by telling you, no, not one, but ten? What do you say? Well, I'll tell you what I say. Well, for your sake, I won't if it offends you. There are a couple of things in my life that in my mind are absolutely perfectly okay that I do not participate in. And it's simply because to some people, it's an offense. I won't tell you what they are because I'm hoping those people die and that goes away and I won't have a new person to be offended. <laughs> I won't tell you what they are because uh, that, that's insignificant. What's significant is the principle behind worshiping God in spirit and truth, worshiping God with the understanding that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It belongs to God. And I'm not going to give place to anything that says that it supplants or displaces God. God made evergreen trees. If you want to have an evergreen tree to the glory of God, go on ahead. He made them. There's nothing bad about anything God made. What could be bad about anything God made is the application of it or what you mean by it. And you could be perfectly innocent in celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ involving a Christmas tree somehow. It's not a big deal to me. For my wife's sake, uh, I'll go get a Christmas tree. I'll cut down 
I'll, I'll steal your Christmas tree or something. And it's, it's mostly because I'm cheap. That's the deal with the Christmas tree. Cheap and lazy, maybe. Don't want to set them up. Okay, so we're finished this evening. We see the principles that we need to embrace. The earth is the Lord and give none offense. The earth is the Lord's and give none offense. And you know you can do that. I'm going to use the lunar calendar because you know what? Our calendar actually uh, is modeled after patterns of the planets that occur on a regular basis. And God made us, made the system of time, made the day and the night, and gave, divided those things. And He used the planets to uh, be part of all of that. And so it's a fine thing. God made the lunar calendar. So I'm going to use it. I don't care if somebody worships the planets. That's silly of them, but God made the planets. Get it? Got it? Granger. <laughs> Good. All right. Father, thank you for what we've learned this evening. I pray that you would increase the knowledge of it in our hearts and the understanding. Help us to be able to live and walk confidently, giving no offense. God, we don't want to be offensive. Sometimes even in speaking and, and uh, joking with the group that's here, Lord, we wouldn't offend anyone, but we could, by the same things, offend some people. So help us be careful in how we present this truth, even to those that we love, that God, these things could be an offense too. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for your good attention tonight. You're dismissed.